this week in Math 278, we will cover grade six, the number system. There is a lot of different standards associated with the number system and a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. So um, based on the different topics, I've tried to touch on many things that we'll see. So here are the first um, pieces, and then we actually have a, another set of pieces as well. So. Uh, brace yourself for the for the longevity, but I think it'll be all okay. We can think about dividing fractions using multiplication and visual models. Let's explore the connection between division and multiplication and make sense of fraction division situations. Write at least two different division and two multiplication equations to match the diagram. There are two copies of two thirds. So when I look at from zero to one, I see that there are uh, broken into thirds and this first part is two thirds and this second part is two thirds. So two copies of two thirds means that we multiply two times two thirds, which is the same as four one thirds which is the same as one and one third. Similarly, we can reverse this as two thirds times two, which is four thirds, which is one and one third. For division, we ask how many two thirds can go into four thirds? So how many of these two thirds goes into the total when I'm broken down into thirds Four thirds. So four thirds divided by two thirds gives us two pieces. We could also ask how many two thirds can go into one and one third, which then breaks down to four thirds um, divided by two thirds, which is what we had earlier. And also, if we have four thirds and we break into two different groups, how many are in each group? And we see that there'd be two thirds. Similarly, along the lines, that same lines, one and one third divided by two is two thirds as well. Match each situation with a division equation, fill in the blanks and draw a diagram. So Mrs. Huxtable split 15 eighths pies left over from the bake sale into this many pieces. How many portions did she make? She made this many portions. Well, she cut them into three eighths, three copies of one eighth pieces, and she was able to make five portions. Using a circle graph or a circle pie graph, I start with 15 eighths. So I need two circles since we have a whole pie and a portion of another pie. I cut my pies into eighths and then I highlighted 15 of them. I can then see if I were to subdivide them into or group them into groups of three copies of one eighth that I'm able to make five complete portions. Situation B, Mrs. Huxtable split 15 copies of one eighth pies, 15 one eighths pie, left over from the bake sale between this many people, how much did each person get? Each person got this much of a pie. Well, since we can't have a fraction of a person, we must have five people and each person must have gotten three eighths of a pie. So again, I have my 15 one eighths pies and this time I'm going to partition them off into five people. So I'm going to label one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I can see that if I were to group all the ones, all the twos, all the threes, all the fours, and all the fives together, each person would get three eighths of the pie. Homework write a story that matches each of the equations. Then use a number line or picture to show how the equations work. Scan and upload your documents to the Story Equations Discussion Board. Take a moment to view the strategies your classmates have submitted. 
We can use common denominators to divide fractions. This may be a new technique for some of you. Write each equation as a division expression and evaluate. Let's start with how many two-fifths are in three. So the division equation is three divided by two-fifths. So on my top line, I have two-fifths. On my bottom line, I have three. I want to know how many two-fifths can fit into three. So if I were to count them, there would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one-fifth here left over, and one-fifth is half of two-fifths. So that would give me seven and one half. Now, what we also could do is turn that three into 15 fifths. If I were to split my three into fifths, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay. And I'm splitting 15 fifths divided by 2 fifths. Notice how I'm taking my numerators and that becomes my division. So 15 fifths divided by 2 fifths is the same as 15 over 2, which is 7 and 1 half. So we're splitting the total 15 into groups of 2 and we're able to get seven groups of two with one half left over. How many two-fifths are in three-fifths? Which the division is three-fifths divided by two-fifths. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how many two-fifths can fit into three-fifths. I can see that two-fifths can go in there one time with one out of the two left over. Similarly, I'm going to take 3 and split it into sections of 2. I'm going to take 3, split it into sections of 2, which is the same as 1 and 1 half, which is what we did visually. How many 2 fifths are in 3 tenths? So I have 3 tenths divided by 2 fifths is how many? I'm going to create a common denominator by splitting my fifths into tenths. So three tenths is the same and two fifths is the same as four tenths. So I want to know how many four tenths can go into three tenths. Well, I don't have enough three tenths here to fill this, but I see that these three tenths fill in three fourths of the way. So 3 divided by 4 is the solution. How many 2 fifths are in 1 tenth? Our division problem is 1 tenth divided by 2 fifths. We need to find a common denominator, so I'm going to split my fifths into tenths. 1 tenth divided by 4 tenths is the same as 1 tenth divided by 2 fifths. I see that if I start with one-tenth, I don't have enough one-tenths to fit all of my, my top two fifths in, but this piece covers a fourth of the original part. So for one-tenth divided by four-tenths is one-fourth. Notice I'm using my numerators when my denominators are the same as our solution. One thermos of hot chocolate uses two thirds cup of cocoa powder. How many thermoses can Nellie make with three cups of cocoa powder? Solve the problem by drawing a picture. How, explain how you can see the answer to the problem in your picture and which of the following multiplication of division equations represents the situation. Solve the arithmetic problem you choose and verify that you get the same answer as your picture. So I've got my picture here. It shows three rectangles that each represent 
one cup of cocoa powder. So one, two, three cups of cocoa powder. Each cup is then divided into thirds, right? Thirds. Since one thermos requires two thirds cup, two thirds are shaded to show a single thermos of cocoa. There are four whole groups of two thirds cup of cocoa and a half a group of two thirds cups of cocoa shown in the picture. So I can create four whole cups. When I look at this leftover, it is half of my groups. So Nellie can make four and a half thermoses of cocoa. Our equation is three cups divided into two thirds. How many is that? Using our common denominators, three is the same as two thirds, excuse me, three is the same as nine thirds. I take my numerators and divide them. Nine halves is the same as four and one half. It requires a fourth of a credit to play a video game for one minute. Emma has seven eighths credit. Can she play for more or less than one minute? Explain. How long can Emma play the video game with her seven eighths of a credit? Well, we're comparing a fourth and seven eighths. So the first thing we need to do is change that one fourth, which we know is the same as two eighths. So one fourth is the same as two eighths of a credit for one minute. Well, if Emma has seven eighths of a credit and it takes two eighths of a credit for one minute, Emma has more than it takes to play the game for one minute, so she can play more than one minute at a time. We know the game requires a fourth of a credit for one minute of playing time. So the whole entire bar line is one credit, and we're interested in about one minute, which is one fourth. We know that Emma, to get have one credit, is listed in below an eighth, and she has seven. We want to know how many one-fourths can go into seven-eighths. I can create a common denominator by breaking my fourths into two pieces for each section. So seven-eighths divided by two-eighths gives us seven-halves, which is the same as three holes and one half left over. Mrs. Smith's cookie recipe uses one and one third cups of flour. Mrs. Smith has five and a half cups of flour. Does, does she have enough flour to make five batches of cookies? Let's identify the dividend, the divisor, the quotient, and the remainder. Write the division expression and find the quotient and write the final solution in a sentence. Well, we ask ourselves how many one and one thirds portions are in five and a half cups of flour. So the dividend is five and a half and the divisor is one and one third. Five and a half divided by one and one third we have listed below. We do not have the same denominator, so I will break the thirds. <clears throat> well, first I have 11 halves. And then second, I have four copies of one third. Now we'll break them into six. They're common denominators, giving me 33 one sixths of flour and eight one sixth of um, portion, portioning out. This gives me 33 eighths. So eight can go into 33 four and one eighths time. So four and an eighth is our quotient, and one eighth is the remainder. Um, Mr. Nelson, this should be Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith does not have enough flour to make five batches of cookies. She has enough flour. She has enough flour to make four batches with an eighth of a portion left over. Let's complete a problem similar to the last one. Mr. Daniels is making more bookshelves. He has a board seven eighths of a meter long. Each shelf will be a fourth of a meter long. Can he make three shelves? 
again, identifying the dividend, divisor, quotient, and remainder, writing the problem as a division problem, and then writing the final solution in a sentence. We ask how many one-fourths can fit into seven-eighths? So seven-eighths is our dividend, and we're dividing them by one-fourth. So seven-eighths divided by one-fourth. We need to have that common denominator again. So one-fourth we know is the same as two-eighths. Two-eighths can fit into seven-eighths, seven and a half times, seven one-half times, or three and a half. Mr. Daniels can make three shelves. There will be enough wood for half of a shelf left over. So the quotient is three and a half, which is the solution, and the remainder of that quotient is one half. Division and multiplication are connected by the multiplicative inverse. Let's make sense of fraction division using multiplication and the multiplicative inverse. Use each digit once to complete each equation. Justify your solution. So we have division and multiplication to 5, 6. The only digits we can use are 2, 3, 4, and 5. I know that um, with multiplication, what we've learned is we move right straight across. So I see that to get to the denominator of 6, we could take 2 times 3. However, there isn't a combination of numbers that we have where we would get something times something else to get 5. So there is no combo of numbers that will multiply to 6 and multiply to 5 at the same time. So what we could do is write equivalent fractions. So 5, 6 we know is the same as 10, 12. Let's see if we can't make something work now. Um, we can use uh, 4 times 3 to get 12 and 2 times 5 to get 10. So we also can use the multiplication equation to now complete the division equation. We will keep the same dividend of 2 fourths, except multiplying by 5 thirds is equivalent to dividing by the multiplicative inverse. So the multiplicative inverse of 5 thirds is 3 fifths. We can justify this because 2 fourths divided by 3 fifths, finding the common denominator of 10 twentieths divided by 12 twentieths is equal to 10 twelfths taking our numerators and dividing them, or 5, 6, which is our original number. 3 fifths and 5 thirds, so dividing by 3 fifths and multiplying by 5 thirds is the multiplicative inverse. Multiplying is equivalent to dividing by the multiplicative inverse. So let's find the quotient. 4 fifths divided by 3 sevenths which we know using the multiplicative inverse that 4 fifths is the same as 7 thirds, which is the same as 28 fifteenths, and 15 can go into 28 one whole time with 13 left over. We can use, we can check using our common denominators. So 4 fifths divided by 3 sevenths, the common denominator would be 35, so 28 one, one thirty fifths divided by 15 one thirty fifths is 28 fifteenths, which is the same as 1 and 13 fifteenths. Homework. Make the smallest product by filling in the boxes using the whole numbers 1 through 9, no more than one time each. Describe your strategy to justify your solution. So it looks like we're creating multiplication of decimals. And then make the largest quotient by filling in the boxes using the whole numbers one through nine, no more than one time each. Describe your strategy to justify your solution. Scan and upload your work to the fill the boxes discussion board. Respond to two different classmates' strategies on how they determined or how they justified their answer. We will use factors of two given numbers to find the least common multiple. We're making breakfast biscuits with one egg and one sausage on each biscuit. Sausage patties come in packs of 10 and eggs are sold by the dozen. How many biscuits will we need to make to not have any leftovers? Make sure not to break any eggs. 
we need to find the least common multiple of 10 and 12. So to do that, we will write the multiples of 10 and 12. So I started with 10. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. The multiplication, um, multiples of 12 are 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, and 72. I see that the smallest one that they have in common is 60. So we will need 60 sausages and 60 eggs, which is five dozen, to make equal amounts of biscuits with no leftovers. We are setting up chairs and Mr. Lee wants two sections, one with 35 chairs and one with 42 chairs. He wants the same number of chairs in each row for both sections. How many chairs will be in each row? It seems here we need to find the greatest common factor of 35 and 42. So I write down all the different factors of 35. 1 times 35, well, 2 times nothing, 3 times nothing, 4 times nothing gives me 35. 5 times 7, 6 times nothing, and 7 times 5. 7 times 5 is a repeat of 5 times 7, which means we can stop. So the factors of 35 are 1, 5, 7, and 35, written from least to greatest. I'll do the same with 42. 1 times 42, 2 times 21, 3 times 14, 4 times nothing, 5 times nothing, 6 times 7, and 7 times 6. We've hit a repeat, so we can stop. The common uh, factors of 42 are 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 14, 21, and 42 written from least to greatest. I see that the greatest common factor that they have in common is seven. <clears throat> Let's find the greatest common factor of 72 and 54. We can list prime factors of 72 and 54. So 54 divided by two is two times 27, but we're not all in fa prime factors yet because 27 is the same as three times nine. And nine is not a prime number yet because it can be divided into three times three. So 54 written in its prime factors is two times three times three times three. Similarly with 72 is the same as two times 36. Six can be broken into six and six and each of the sixes can be broken down in two and three. 72 is the same as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3. So I brought all my 2s together and my 3s together. The ones that they have in common are 2 times 3 times 3, which is 18. So the greatest common factor is 18. Phew, that was a lot of work. There's got to be something easier we can do. Let's find the least common multiple of 8 times 10. The factors of eight are one, two, four, and eight. Those are all numbers that can evenly divide into eight. The factors of 10 are one, two, five, and 10. The greatest common factor of eight and 10 is two. But I asked for the least common multiple. I wonder what's happening here. The product of our numbers is eight times 10, which is 80. I were to take that product and divide it by the greatest common factor of two, we would get 40. Therefore, the least common multiple of eight and 10 is 40. Let's find the least common multiple of six and 12 using the greatest common factor. Factors of six are one, two, three, and six. Factors of 12 are one, two, three, four, six, and 12. The greatest common factor of six and 12 is six. The product of our numbers, six times 12, divided by the greatest common factor. Six times 12 is 72, and 72 divided by six is 12. Therefore, the least common multiple is 12. We can use factors of two given numbers to find their least common multiple. This is true because every factor of two given numbers is also a factor of every multiple of those two numbers. May is thinking about area models and how to, 
how the structure helps her find out missing information. I wonder what number is under the purple square. I know on the top that I have six plus five and that my two it pieces of the area are broken down into 24. Well, the product of 24 is produced by the factors six and four. Six is already listed, so four is the missing factor. Further, four, our left-hand side, times the top of six plus five is equal to four times six plus four times five, which is 24 plus 20. Together, the sum is 44. Do we need to use a different strategy to figure out this missing number? May is still wondering what number is under the purple square. Well, I know that nine times seven is 63, and nine times eight is 72. So the purple box must be 72. Further, nine times seven plus eight is nine times seven and nine times eight, or 63 and 72 for a total of 135. Do the purple numbers have to be decimals in the area model? So she's still wondering what numbers are under the purple area. So I know that 5 tenths times 6 tenths is 3 tenths for the first purple box. Therefore, 5 tenths times 7 tenths is 35 hundredths for the second purple box. This would then give us 5 tenths times the quantity of 6 tenths plus 7 tenths, which is equal to 3 tenths plus 35 hundredths, which is equivalent to 65 hundredths. May is ready for a real challenge. Let's determine what the different colored boxes are. Take a moment to pause the video and work through all the different colored boxes and see what you come up with. I get 24 times 13 for 312. 24 times 7 to get 168, so our purple boxes are completed. I asked what times 7 tenths gives me 42 hundredths, which is 6 tenths. Further, 6 tenths times 1 and 5 tenths is 9 tenths. Further, I asked what times 8 gives me 128, which is 16. 16 times what gave me 208, which was 13. This one was a little more tricky. I first thought about all the different numbers that divided into 39, which were 3 and 13. Then I compared if any one of those numbers went into 26. 13 did, so I knew that 13 had to be my left-hand number. So 13 times 3 is 39, 13 times 5 gave me 65, and 13 times 2 gave me 26. The greatest common factor can be used to write equivalent expressions to solve problems. We can write equivalent expressions using the greatest common factor and the distributive property. The number line can show both distance and direction. The sets of positive and negative numbers exist in opposite directions from zero. The table shows three different transactions Ashley made at the bank. Represent these transactions on a number line. So now our number line moves left and we are now getting negative. If I withdrew $2, that would mean I would be subtracting $2 from my account. If I were depositing $9, that would mean I would be adding money to my account. And finally, if I were to withdraw money or withdraw $5, I would be subtracting $5 from my account. More formally, the set of integers includes whole numbers, their opposites, and zero. How can we use opposites in the meaning of zero to help us describe real life situations? Kendra had a fun day in town at the movie theater, amusement park, and arcade. Use the number line to describe a path she could have taken that includes distances and locations. How could you describe the distance between the movie theater and the arcade? Well, I see the movie theater is on the far left and the arcade is on the far right. She went a total of eight units from the movie theater to the arcade, 
simply by counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> we can compare integers by looking at their distance and direction from each other in zero. We will use inequalities to compare integers in real life situations. Brock is watching a dolphin dive. He records the information in a table. Which dive was the deepest? And what would zero represent in this situation? We're using a vertical number line. If a dolphin dove a distance of five feet, he would be under the water at negative five. Similarly, if the dolphin dove at nine feet, we would be at negative nine. And finally, a dolphin do dove at seven feet would be at negative seven. Negative seven is smaller or less than negative five. Negative nine is also less than negative seven. Zero represents the location where the dolphin enters the water, so zero is the water level. Take a moment to pause the video and identify if each inequality is true or false. Then we'll come back and talk about it. The first one is true. Negative nine is smaller than negative seven, which is smaller than negative three. The second one is false. Negative six is not smaller than negative eight. It should be reversed. The third one is also false. Negative eight is not greater than negative four. Negative eight is less than negative four. And the final one is true. Negative five is smaller than negative two. Circle the scenarios below that are true. Ashley owes Michael $12 and Jerry owes Michael $7. Ashley owes Michael more than Jerry. That is true. Team A lost seven yards on the football field, which is more than Team B, who lost 12 yards on the football field. This one is false, because Team B lost more than Team 7, because 12 is larger than 7. The temperature on Monday was negative 12 degrees Celsius, which is less than the temperature on Tuesday, which is negative 7 degrees Celsius. This is true. Negative 12 is smaller than or less than negative seven. Denver, Colorado is the called the mile high city because its elevation is 5,280 feet above sea level. Someone tells you that the elevation of Death Valley, California is negative 282 feet. Is Death Valley located above or below sea level? explain. Death Valley is located below sea level. We know this because its elevation is negative. Sea level is our base for measuring elevation. Sea level is defined as zero feet. Because Death Valley is measured at negative 282 feet, this is below sea level. How many feet higher is Denver than Death Valley? I'm gonna use a number line here, almost like an open number line. Um, I've got zero there, negative 282 on the left of zero, and 5,280 on the right of zero. To get from negative 282 to zero, it is a distance of 282 units. Then to get from zero to 5,280 is 5,280 units. 282, plus 5,280 is 5,562 feet. So therefore, Denver is 5,562 feet higher than Death Valley. What would your elevation be if you were standing near the ocean? Since we are standing near the ocean, our elevation would be close to zero. The absolute values of rational numbers and their opposites are equivalent. The absolute value of a number is determined by its distance away from zero. 
So when I look at 0 to 0 0.3, its absolute value is 3 tenths. The opposite of 3 tenths is negative 3 tenths. Negative 3 tenths is also 3 tenths away from 0. So the absolute value, which are those goalpost signs looking like, of negative 3 tenths is equal to the absolute value of 3 tenths. Since opposite numbers are equidistant from 0, their absolute values are also equivalent. 45 hundredths is the opposite of negative 45 hundredths. And negative 45 hundredths, the absolute value, is equivalent to the absolute value of 45 hundredths. According to the table of some of the coldest and hottest recorded temperatures on Earth, how many places have the same absolute temperature? meaning their coldest temperature is the same as another place's hottest temperature. So when I look at the table, I count um, Russia and Israel have absolute temperatures. Russia and Ethiopia have absolute value temperatures. And those are the only two that I see. So there are two of them. Also, is it true or false that the hottest temperature in the table has a greater absolute value than the coldest temperature. Well, the hottest temperature on the table is 160 degrees. The coldest temperature looks like negative 136 in Antarctica. When I compare the absolute values of negative 136 and 160, the hottest temperature is the greater absolute value. So this is true. Now that we have an understanding of negative numbers, we can extend our coordinate plane to include positive and negative numbers. Horizontal and vertical number lines create the x-axis, which runs horizontal, and the y-axis, which runs vertical, which allows us to plot and locate points. Name the coordinates of the given points. Let's start with A. Starting at the origin, we move to the right three units and neither up or down. So the point is 3, 0. Starting at the origin, we move left 5 units and up 6 units, so negative 5, 6. Starting at the origin, we move left 8 units and down 5 units, so negative 8, negative 5. The first quadrant on the top right, which is what we covered in 5th grade as well, is known as quadrant 1. We then move in a counterclockwise distance for count quadrant 2 on the top left, quadrant 3 on the bottom left, and quadrant 4 on the bottom right. We also know that the point at which we start is called the origin. Plot the points with the given coordinates. Point A, 5, negative 2. So we start at the origin, always moving left or right first, 5, and then we go down 2. B, 0, negative 4. So we're not moving left or right from the origin, but we are moving down 4 units. Point C, we start at the origin, move left 7, and we move up 8. Correct the two errors on the coordinate plane. Pause the video and we'll see if we can't come together and see if we get the same errors found. I see that the first error is the point in the fourth quadrant. This point should be named 3, negative 4. It appears the student reversed the x and y coordinates. The second error I see is the coordinate in the third quadrant. The point should be negative 8, negative 9. Reflect these points across the x-axis and reflect these points across the y-axis. So if I want to reflect point A across the x-axis, it needs to move upwards. And just because I'm moving up, we are not moving left or right. So all that's changing is my y-coordinate becomes, uh, becomes the opposite. Similarly with point B, if I move it across the x-axis, 
it now becomes the point negative 3, negative 4. Now moving the y across the y-axis with point C, negative 9, negative 9, this becomes positive 9, negative 9. Notice I'm just shifting left or right, but I'm not moving up or down. Point D is the same. We will move our point to the left, but not up or down. So our new point becomes negative 7, positive 8. Given the coordinates, which points are reflections of one another over the x-axis? Point negative 7, 9 for point A is in the top left quadrant, so the second quadrant. 7, negative 9 is down here. These are not reflections over the x-axis. This is actually a reflection um, over the origin. Um, point B is 7, 9. So this would be a reflection over the y-axis. And these two could be a reflection over the x-axis. Further, the point... Um, negative 7, negative 9, point A and C could also be reflections over the x-axis. So A and D are points over the x-axis. Absolute value is used to find the distance between points in the plane that differ by one coordinate. Find the length of the given statements. So here I have the points. Um, A is negative 5, or negative 3, 5, and B is negative 3, negative 6. Notice that our x values are the exact same. So it takes 5 units to get from A to the x-axis. And then from the x-axis to B is 6 units. So the absolute value of 5 plus the absolute value of negative 6 is 5 plus 6, which is 11 units. C and D. This time, our x values are different, and our y values are the same. So the absolute value of 6, negative 6, minus the absolute value of negative 4 is 6 minus 4, which is 2. We also could count that there are two units difference. Absolute value is used to find the difference between the points. Find the length of the given segments. Let's start with A. A is negative 7, 7, 13, 7. So notice our Y values are the same. So we're having a horizontal change. Negative 7 plus 13. The absolute values is 7 plus 13, so a distance of 20. The point C to point D. Notice their x values are the same. It's the y values that change. And notice we're moving down, so we'll subtract here. The absolute value of negative 3 minus the absolute value of negative 10. So 3 minus 10 is negative 7. But I have a comment here that... We don't count distance in negative numbers, so it has to be 7. Finally, we are moving left and right, so our x values change. Negative 5 absolute value plus the absolute value of 1 is 5 plus 1, which equals 6.